came out just a couple of days ago, or just a few days ago, rather, as we uh, crossed over to 2022, this fantastic hour and 42 minute special that HBO Max did and spared no expense in bringing a majority of the cast members back here to talk about their experiences, set, setting these uh, interviews on all these old school Harry Potter sets, building all the things they built, sh shooting sequences on the platform of nine and three quarters, all through Diagon Alley into Ollivanders. They, we had uh, Daniel Radcliffe, we had uh, Rupert Grint, we had uh, uh, Emma Watson come back, but we also had Robbie Coltrane and Gary Oldman, Helena Bonham Carter, uh, we had the Chris Columbus, we had Alfonso Cuaron, we had David Yates, uh, we had so many people come back to be a part of this thing, Jason Isaacs, Tom Felton, so many, Ginny Wiz, uh, I forget her name, the Jenny actress who plays Ginny, Bonnie Wright I think is her name, uh, all of them, Luna Lovegood, the actress who plays Luna Lovegood, all of them coming back to talk about their experiences now 20 years later. And I have to say, right off the bat, to me, this was a wonderful thing to experience. Having worked in that uh, Wizarding World of Harry Potter land, you really get an idea of how important this franchise is to so many people. And by osmosis, I took that on playing that character, the Wand Keeper. So watching this special just made me relive those feelings and those emotions all over again, plus enjoying the back half of the movies as much as I did. So, gentlemen, what did you all think about this special? What did you feel about it as you were watching it? What stood out to you? I mean, I, lo I love an HBO Max reunion special. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, following on the, on the, on the, on the heels of, uh, on the heels of Friends. Uh, I, I this one was so much more impactful just because you know uh, most of the cast were kids mm. and watching how they have grown up and how they've changed over over the last twenty years, um, you know the movies themselves. Like I love the books, the movies themselves. I never thought they fully encapsulated the magic uh, of those books, except for three. And this is a very unpopular opinion. But parts of four, like I thought Goblet of Fire, I know it's very unpopular. I think Goblet of Fire, there is some of the best Potter moments in that story. Oh, but then Shannon, going, I, <laughs> Shannon, it is, my... it is, it is, Order it of the is, Phoenix, uh, man. Come on. it man. is Goblet of Fire for dummies. I mean, it is a Cliff Notes <laughs> movie, but I think the notes that they hit are great. I mean, <laughs> I, I know I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> when I say I like Goblet of Fire, there's the uh, look. Um, but also revisiting the, you know, some of the older performers. I had no idea, like, Robbie Coltrane, he appears to be in, in a wheelchair now. Yeah. And but but hearing these stories, he, hearing, especially when they talk about performers that have passed, like, like Alan Rickman, like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it was just... For having not been the biggest fan of the movies, that special was incredibly well done and just really beautiful to see. I mean, my uh, my fiance, who also is not really into the movies, I mean, she was in tears by the end. I mean, mm -hmm. she's like, this is so well done. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it, it tempted me to go on to HBO Max and be like, all right, let's let's revisit some of these. Like, let's skip around and, and, and visit the best parts of this universe. Mikey? I'm still recovering from this reveal about Shannon loving Goblet of Fire, so I'm trying to just like <laughs> settle myself here. But um, I, I agree that it was great. It was super well done. Um, look, as someone who truly, truly loves the books mm -hmm. and disagreeing with Shannon a little bit, like the movies are not, I mean, not as often as the case, like the books are so rich and there's so much that happens. And a movie uh, at two and a half, almost three hours, even then can't always capture everything that's in the books. But I think the thing that I took away from this whole thing is, aside from a handful of recasting, the fact that these kids, this cast, went from one movie all the way to the eighth movie and told this complete story of one of the most beloved modern pieces of fiction that we have and turned it into something that is almost equally as beloved by everybody except Shannon. So <laughs> I think that in, in that respect, just the achievement of that was great. And, in, and as you guys said, it really did make me relive my love of this world, mm -hmm. which was really valuable to me because so much of what the creator of this world has done in recent memory right. has really made me not love the world as much. And I do think one of the things that I was texting with some friends about that was very um, clear is that uh, in the one hour and 40 odd minute special, I think Joe Rowling is in it about 
two minutes maybe yeah. and it is clearly marked as previously recorded footage that is not that was not recorded for this special so i think that they also probably wisely went out of their way to make this about the process of adapting these books into movies yeah. uh and she's mentioned a handful of times but this is really about this creative process and this journey that Columbus and Quaron and Newell and Yates took everybody on. Um, and it did really, honestly, allow me to enjoy the things that I loved about Harry Potter without being distracted by the one ginormous thing that I really have a problem with. Yeah, it was weird, Mike. I, I, I understand that. And I, and I, I was able to separate that, I guess, because I they took me back to that time, right? And at that time, I don't know that Joe Rowling. This is the Joe Rowling at that time is the Joe Rowling I am willing to kind of like create space for this, you know, single mom who is struggling, broke, wrote this on a train, back more. So like to remember the beginnings, I thought it was nice to kind of go back to that and kind of not think about what her points of views are now about uh, uh, the trans rights and trans lives and all of that, which is really upsetting and disturbing. It was nice to kind of put that away for a little bit and just focus on why we fell in love with this franchise. And you hit on something really, really um, important here, Mike. You know, people talk about the MCU and Kevin Feige and blah, blah, blah. People talk about their favorite franchise, best franchises ever. Harry Potter, eight, eight films, what they were able to do here. And yes, you can argue varying degrees of good or whatever, but like it's incredible to have seen what they've done on this entire journey. I don't know if there's ever going to be a franchise that's going to do eight movies that fans consistently run to and watch and give a lot of money to and watch over and over again or as beloved as it is and seeing I really loved you know kind of pulling the curtain back and it, it wasn't like just a you know gloss over approach you got to hear about um Emma Watson and Rupert Grant and how they struggled with the fame you got to hear about Daniel Radcliffe's approach to working with Gary Oldman you got to hear about Chris Columbus's approach you know what I came away with a completely different point of view about Chris Columbus now and his approach to these movies and I really appreciated that through those interviews through those conversations hearing what their experiences were like and i'm talking about emma and daniel and rupert through the process it's great to have a little bit more of them talking about it now 20 years later not while they're going through it but 20 years later now talking about it and having some fun little nuggets i mean having daniel read what he wrote to helena bottom carter essentially shooting his shot i mean i you gotta respect that you know you know all of that stuff through it was great and but gary oldman that son of a bitch man he broke me in half just having him talk so eloquently and so warmly towards Daniel Radcliffe and talk about their experiences creating you could tell that and, and hearing from Alfonso and how Gary took all this time to really make this connection with Daniel off camera as well as on camera so that that really came out and you can tell in their back and forth and especially when they um, when Gary finds out that Alan Rickman got insider information from Joe Rowling, that moment is so precious because you're like, of course, Alan Day, that son of a bitch, you know, and that's the way you talk about someone. <laughs> Even when he's passed, you give him his respect, but you also bust his balls. And I love that that was an element throughout this entire um, specialist that didn't shy away from talking about this stuff and let you see a little more behind the curtain, so to speak, of the creation and the experiences that everybody had within it, you know? Yeah, I mean, the cynical part of me, and this is just because it's always the case, is that, uh, you know, like, they do such a good job. Uh, and, and, and it all is very genuine. I'm not going to say mm. anything super mm. bad. Like, I actually really did enjoy it. But as I was watching it, you know, you have these great moments of, like, you know, the three of them, like, Emma and Rupert and Daniel, like, sitting in the Gryffindor common room and just yeah. shooting the shit about their memories. And because I've been... Uh, on sets where you're doing like behind the scenes stuff, whatever, you know that there's like just out of sight is like not just the director of this piece, but like 30 publicists and PR people and somebody being like, all right, we need to do the bit about people who have passed on. So why don't you talk about heart? So like there is an, a level of this is being produced. So it's not like right. they just like sat everybody in a room and said, yeah, why don't you talk about it? What it was like. So everything that they're hitting is we want to talk about this stuff. Right. But I think even within that, um, the sincerity that you get out of them yeah. about the things that they talked about and the emotion um, and the excitement. And I think like, you know, what what's hard to remember about that time is that when they were cast, they were at the age that they were just as excited about Harry Potter as all of us were. Like yeah. this, like when Chris Columbus talks about all these kids getting cast and running around on set at Hogwarts and how it was like hard to keep their attention because they were just so stoked to be in Harry Potter, uh, you know, and or, and like, 
Uh, you know, Jason Isaac says this, uh, Ray Fine says it. Each of them is like, yeah, I told somebody that, uh, I told my sister that I was uh, up for Voldemort. And she was like, what? Like, just <laughs> the, that these were the biggest, like, there's a reason that you got some of the greatest actors of our time to be in these movies. Um, and then just to have Emma and Rupert and Daniel kind of talk about their, what it was like being a kid actor, but mm -hmm. then what it was like being that middle age actor where you wanted to be better and then growing into actual actors. Like all of those bits I thought were, were really, really well done. And uh, it just, it did, it just made me, it made me kind of fall back in love with the, to your point, John, the Harry Potter that I grew up loving. Mm. Yeah, and you see how many people, how many people were involved. Yeah. in creating this, you know, eight film, eight film journey. Um, I thought it was the craziest thing when Jason Isaacs uh, uh, revealed that he had read for Gilderoy Lockhart. I was like, <laughs> what? I could see that. Jason's played those comedic beats. But I mean, I think Isaacs is they, they one, cast correctly. one of the best, one of the best performers out there. It, it always surprises me that he's not found the vehicle to take him to superstar level because J I think he's just such a, such a brilliant performer, yeah. but the idea that he was up for Guild War Lockhart and in the midst of the audition, like, hey, read this instead. Like, we know you play the heavy in almost everything. <laughs> read this one too. And then finding out that uh, the, the crush that Emma Watson had on Tom Felton. Yeah. Right. Um, when the Wizarding World first opened Islands of Adventure, so this is many years ago now, um, a, a friend of mine did a lot of the promotional events and she got to spend some time with Tom Felton and she, just saying that guy's crazy. She's mm. like, you want to talk about just such a down to earth, really nice, really genuinely enthusiastic guy. She's like, you know, he made this whole sort of press tour um, so, so much more bearable because it was so chaotic and was so stressful. I mean, the expectations were so high. And she's like, and he was just such a breath of fresh air. That's awesome. And I mean, and as Johnny mentioned, like I already knew this fact, but every time anybody talks about it, I think is great is the fact that for years, Alan Rickman was the only other person in the world that knew what was going on with Snape. Like this is a fact that always, <laughs> always, always gives me so much joy that as everyone was going through these movies and as we were still experiencing the books, like, you know, be, as because like they, there was that overlap where like, you know, in five, six and seven, the books were coming out and we already had the movies and the soundtracks and everything else that we're all like, you know, why is Snape the way he is? Is Snape good? Is he bad? Is he right. a Death Eater? Is he this? And that he knew about Lily Potter. He knew about his Patronus. He knew why he hated Harry so much, but why he was still, like, he knew all of these things and the directors didn't know. And like, they'd be like, do this. And he'd be like, no, I can't tell you why, but I'm not doing that. Like, <laughs> that fact makes me love Alan Rickman so much and just love Snape so much. It just makes me love it because that was like one of the great reveals. Like that whole yeah. backstory of Snape is one of the greatest things. I will say also really quickly that watching this, particularly when Alfonso Cuaron is talking about shooting the scene in the Shrieking mm. Shack yeah. with David Thewlis Ooh. and Gary Oldman and Alan Rickman and the kids and everybody in it. Um, I actually went back and rewatched that scene of Azkaban because it's one of my favorite scenes in all eight movies. Um, HBO Max, please just do a fucking Marauder show. I don't care about the Fantastic Beasts. I don't care about what happens with that. I think you're not going to tell me the Dumbledore Grindelwald story I really want. But please give me a story yeah. about Peter Pettigrew, Sirius Black, uh, uh, James Potter. Um, Lupin. Lupin, thank Lupin, you. Yeah. Snape and Lily at Hogwarts. Like, I want it. I need it. <laughs> Everybody will watch it. Please, please just make this fucking show. Yeah, and, and seeing the clips from the movies I thought were was, was so great. And it made me want to buy them all in 4K because, I mean, clearly they've cleaned those things up. Not that they needed that much cleaning up, but seeing that scene that you mentioning, Michael, that looked gorgeous in, in the special and made me want to watch that scene all over, watch the whole movie all over again because it's been a bit since I watched it. I may be revisiting them for the channel, having some fun. Maybe we'll do some something if we feel like it and, and mess around with it. But like, it's great to kind of walk back in. But then also seeing the clips of them shooting stuff, the, the test screenings, the uh, stuff behind the scenes, being on set and the interactions with them all on set. I thought that was nice to watch all of that so you get an idea of how 
um, of what a massive production this actually was. And Chris Columbus saying how like the first one I was scared out of my mind. And then after it did so well, then I felt like I was on easy street. And I do kind of it's interesting when they gloss over how he didn't come back for the third one. I think it was very clear, like they wanted to move into a new direction. Quaron was the decision. The kids are getting older. We need something darker. And they didn't want to. So I don't know if was it Columbus's decision to leave? Is that the narrative or was it that they felt that they wanted to go in a direction? And so they I mean, moved him off. Like, what's the story here? I didn't know that. I don't know for sure. But I mean, look, I don't think that anybody was unhappy with the box office. Of, right. True. Uh, Fair point. Sorcerer of, uh, of um, Chamber of Secrets. Sorcerer, Sorcerer Stone or Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know that they would be like, oh, we clearly need to go in a different direction. Like they clearly had a good thing going. Um, so I don't know. I I, I kind of feel like it was more Columbus's choice, but I could be 100 percent wrong. Okay. I love Quaron coming in. I would have yeah. loved him to stay. I think Mike Newell doing one movie is definitely Warner Brothers choice. Uh, <laughs> and I think I'm real, real glad they brought Yates in. Yeah. Uh, and I also think to your point about the subtext, I mean, look, uh, again, Shannon's opinions aside, Goblet of Fire, not one of my favorite Harry Potter movies. Agreed. I think there are some great moments. And I think the whole uh, Voldemort coming back in the graveyard is really, really well done. And I think that over the years, I've come to enjoy Goblet of Fire more than I did in the theaters. But it is still for sure my least favorite of the eight movies. Um, my boy! My my boy, boy. My boy. But, but, I, but what I didn't know, like, you can really kind of tell a few things. Like, one of the issues I have with Goblet of Fire is a massive amount of overacting on yes. absolutely everybody's part. And when you watch Mike Newell, especially in the behind the scenes footage, you're like, oh, that's why. <laughs> Let cool. me get on the floor with another <laughs> young actor and wrestle. This all makes this all makes a lot more sense now. And also the fact that Emma Watson, you know, was talking about even just like her uncomfortability with the winter yeah. ball and that scene where yeah. Hermione has to come downstairs and Mike Newell directing and then her kind of not wanting to come back after that and having to be convinced to come back for the fifth movie. Um, I don't, I'm not putting all that at Mike Newell's feet. And again, I will agree with Shannon that parts of Goblet of Fire are very lovely, but you can sort of see as you're watching it, as you're looking at the subtext, Quaron, like everybody looked like they were having a blast and yeah. Yates clearly kind of came in and were like, yeah, you're going to take this to the finish line. Like you've got a good thing going and like five, six, seven and seven part two, um, all feel of a piece together for yes. sure. Yeah. But you yeah. look at that Newell stuff and you're like, yeah, I think everybody behind the scenes kind of uh, felt the same way. Yeah, I wonder well, I mean, and there's and there's footage of him barking at people. And that's yeah. that's a that's a director from another time. <laughs> Yeah. Like you not you can't do that anymore, especially when you're working with a large cast of young people. Like yeah. you can't you can't do that. But who were all, who were all clearly in the midst of puberty and wanting yeah. to. Uh, when Daniel Radcliffe <laughs> says how hard it was that they were all like going oh through God. like puberty and crushes and everything, and then they brought in the Bobatons and the Durmstrang kids who were all <laughs> purposely cast to be as attractive as possible. He was like, yeah. <laughs> This I was like I can't imagine. All I could think of is I want to know the stuff that they couldn't say in the special. Like I want to know what really went <laughs> yeah. down on that set with all those kids because that Hogwarts got freaky. Oh Hogwarts yeah, Hogwarts got freaky. I mean, what's his face refers to it and says like we were all just like normally you know do things that normal kids do when they're all around each other. So what are the breakups? Who dated who? Who got the drama? Who was sending those yeah. texts? I want to know all that stuff. Who was sending was Daniel Ned. Radcliffe 10 kisses texts? I think it was Ned. And he was like, look, it's, we were doing the same thing that any other kid would do. We were just doing it in uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts. And I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that they didn't touch on at all the, the passing of Richard Harris and Michael Gambon coming in. Like, I was like, wow, oh, I wonder right. why, why they good didn't point. address that at all. I was going to say, well, they did touch on his passing, but they didn't touch on Gambone sliding in. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Mike, sorry. No, it's really, I, I, I didn't think about that. Uh, mm. It is interesting that they didn't dive into that. Uh, it's it's funny. I mean, and this is just kind of speaks to what a good job they did is until you mentioned that, I didn't even think about the fact that they didn't mention, you know, like mm. it was like, it, it really is a pretty, as far as recastings go, uh, tragic because I think Richard Harris did such a lovely job, oh, but so I thought great. what Michael Gambone brought in aside from the fourth movie, uh, was really, really lovely. <laughs> yeah, it's, 
And there was no Brendan Gleeson. I was kind of surprised not to see Brendan Gleeson uh, be a part of this. Julie Walters wasn't a part of this yeah. as well. And so there were there were people that were missing that I would have gl- I would have been very glad to see a few more minutes from or a few an extra twenty minutes added to this uh, special to get some more time with them to find out you know their experiences uh, on it. I, I mean, um, David Tennant also not appearing. David sure. Tennant having a bit of a small part there in a uh, goblet of fire so i mean it was kind of surprising not to have him not surprising not to have him be a part of this uh overall as well but i tell you this um they broke me with the uh, helen mccrory conversation uh you know this is an actress that i've come to know through peaky blinders and some other things uh, uh throughout the last few years and so her passing uh, recently um was kind of shocking and then to see how tom felton spoke Andrew's about her Isaac's. Uh, and Jason Isaacs, Isaacs, right? Yes, absolutely. But Tom, you could see that he that he was ready to to break, to cry and break. Jason, you could tell he was kind of holding on to it. But it was so interesting to hear them speak. And then the shots that they used in the tribute to her got me. They just got me yeah. because she is an incredible actress. And then talking about Alan Rickman and and their feelings about him and their remembrances of him and the power that he has, especially when you know when uh, the Daniel Radcliffe is talking about having worked with him and the interactions that he had with him was really really interesting to see and 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 kind of got to me, got me misty eyed, man. Great stuff overall, and them doing that in memoriam and then all those. I thought it was gonna be like you know five or six names, but then all these names popped up. So how many people involved in the production? have passed away in the last 20 years uh, pretty sad to see yeah I, I don't i don't think shaney made it to the end of the movie i don't think she's seen the whole series oh, okay. but like when the when the phelps brothers came up who you know played fred and george right and, oh. talk about long bottoming those two got hot <laughs> dear god <laughs> Well, they long bottom. Like it's a I, word. <sighs> I, I won't disagree with like they they. I mean, they were they were good looking kids. But yes, they clearly hit the weights. I would say love gooding. Um, I would say love gooding as well. But that's me. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> lo- long bottoming is actually the term that people use for Neville. Yes, because he. But like you say, another thing. Like when when the when the How to Train Your Dragon two came out, you're like, look, Hiccup just got long bottomed. Like it's a <laughs> word. All right. Fair. But watching the two of like seeing like just the light relationship and how mm. what a fun relationship they had with the rest of the cast. How they did kind of uh, younger brother Rupert grin a little bit, and then remembering the last book or the last movie. And oh I was yeah, like, oh shit, that's right. Like, and I don't have the heart to tell Shaney. I'm like, yeah, don't 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 get too attached to one of them. And, and um, that I'm, being one of J.K.'s biggest regrets, she said, you know, I shouldn't have killed him off. She's and no. and same thing with. Uh, with Diggory, I think she's had regrets about Diggory as well, because that character could have really paid dividends. Yeah, they didn't get Pattinson to come on and talk about it. This supposedly incredible film from Shannon McClung's point of view didn't get okay. Or, okay, or, let's pump the brakes. <laughs> or, 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 or Clemens' poesy to come on and see what it was like to take on the Bobatons, you know, and uh, that would have been great to see her point of view on it, and because she she endures throughout the movies into the last couple yeah. of movies, so. There should have been some conversations uh, with both of them as well. But um, was there anything, uh, as we're wrapping up this review, was there any reveal that surprised you guys at all that you hadn't seen in the behind the scenes or hadn't read about in interviews with them? Was there anything that uh, kind of shocked you to hear about or see? It didn't, it didn't shock me, but I like we and we already kind of touched on this, but mm. I do think it was really nice how they, you know, I think I think Rupert Grint says it. Uh, that that they were kind of astronauts like they lived through something yeah. that no one else like playing three of the most beloved characters in modern literature from a 10 year old through adulthood and living through that fame and that work schedule and the attention and then surviving i mean you know look all you got to do is look at the freaking disney channel and see what happens to child actors like half of them right. are disasters and neither none of the three of them are dancing on a beach somewhere like lindsay lohan like they really did kind of make it through for the most part oh, now we're gonna get um, sued yeah go ahead yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean but like you just like i think what i took away from it was just like everybody grew, everybody who grew up on this set kind of came through um, like relatively unscathed. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I think Tom Felton does a great job of highlighting uh, uh, Emma Watson's unique experience as kind of the only main girl in the cast until, of course, Ginny Weasley came. Ginny Ginny Weasley came on, but she was the main girl and dealing with her growing up. And you know, they didn't touch on this, but there were a lot of really uncomfortable stuff that was going on uh, in comments on social media, in memes, you know, all that stuff about alluding to her attractiveness, even though she's an underage girl. Like there was stuff like that that was rolling through, and what she had to deal with on a large scale um as she's growing up you know uh, when they come to that point where she's talking about i wanted to leave and rupert was like yeah i kind of had those same thoughts too the overwhelming nature of it all but tom giving her so much credit for her having the strength the unique strength to come through this and come out the other side and i think her being an intelligent young actress from the beginning which uh, 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 uh chris columbus talks about she was the most intelligent person in the room no matter what room she was in you could tell and her writing that 12 pages for Quaron for a character story. She's a prepared, intelligent young woman. And now we see her as this damn good actress and also damn good advocate for the things mm -hmm. that she believes in. And so it paid dividends, although it might have been it must have been very, very difficult to go through that time. It paid dividends in the end by, turn, you know, giving her that spine, giving her some steel to go after what she wants to go after. And I mean, it really is kind of cute when you think about like each of their careers. Uh, yeah. You know, she went on to become this advocate to really like fight for women's rights and fight for feminism and she's doing a lot of really good stuff and Daniel Radcliffe seems like he's having a perfectly great career he's doing a lot yep. of really cool things and Rupert Grant kind of does a couple things and it's kind of doing his own thing and doesn't really seem too concerned about it like there's pretty Ron. much Ron Harry and Hermione yeah. their way through life <laughs> and that's great that's for, sure. that's for sure I mean you bring it up the 12 page assignment like <laughs> Rupert Grant saying like well I didn't do it he's like but that's something Ron would do he would do the assignment and seeing Karan be like okay Touche. Point okay, taken. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Rob, Robbie Coltrane, like Robbie Coltrane, uh, you know, I, I yeah. used to love watching him on screen. I thought he was just mm. such a terrific performer. But the, the the revelation is like, you know, I spent more time with these kids than with my own kids. And you mm. think about the fact that they did so, they did so much in a really sort of uh, not not compromised, but a a, a a truncated amount of time, a like concentrated much, amount of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and thinking like, yeah, I mean, it wasn't just the kids on this on this schedule. It was also yeah. the adults who do have families, do have children of their own. And yeah, I mean, it was really, it was just, yeah. As I, I love Robbie Coltrane, I hated to see like yeah. that he's just that he's gotten old, like everybody yeah. does. Yeah. But I mean, he's a man of size and to see that he's still around, I think that's a good thing. We all know actors of size who have passed away too early, uh, sadly, but the fact that Robbie's still kicking it, I, I, that's a that's a positive. Even though he's in what seems to be like a, a decreased physical condition, it's still nice to see him talk. And he has that kind of grandfatherly voice that you're just like, oh my God, it's heartbreaking, you know, and everything like that. And, you know, Mike, I take your point, you know, a little bit of produced authenticity, but nonetheless still effective for sure i don't know if they're acting when they're seeing each other for the first time and giving each other big hugs and stuff like that i would hope to think that they weren't but they probably were i mean but it look, was still nice to yeah. see it it was still nice to see it. Yeah. i don't say it in a bad way no, no, like, I know. everything is produced like it is what it is but uh but um but yeah i uh I think they did a very good job of producing it yeah i agree a thousand percent a thousand percent and <laughs> Credit to everybody. Yeah. And I think the last thing that I'll say about it is just touching on the JK Rowling of it all is like, I think that it kind of just gave me hope for the future of Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, and by that, I mean, look, I like, and again, some people who are listening to us uh, think there's nothing wrong with JK Rowling. Some people are not going to support anything Harry Potter because they don't want to support JK Rowling. And I, everyone is free to live their fandoms however they want to live their fandoms. Absolutely. But for me, um, it made me realize that Harry Potter as a world and Harry Potter as uh, as something that has meant so much to so many people is bigger than J.K. Rowling in the mm -hmm. same way that Star Wars is bigger than George Lucas at this point. Like, like she might have created this world, but the fans and the directors and the set designers and the actors and everybody who have weighed in on this world have made it so much more than what it was. Uh, and I think that the world is going to continue long after J.K. Rowling does. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to being able to support the parts of this universe that are inclusive, that are the Hogwarts and the Wizarding World that I believe in. Um, and hopefully that Wizarding World continuing on long before somebody with outdated ideas does. And uh, 
and becomes even more inclusive. So it just, the feelings that this special gave me made me feel like Harry Potter will live on and the wizarding world will thrive uh, and be stronger um, despite some things that I find pretty much uh, not to my liking. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I, yeah, it was nice to go back and remember and seeing all those lines and seeing, you know, uh, and Bobby Coltrane saying how it kind of inspired kids to read again. You know, there are many sure. give it a, many gifts from this franchise and from these sets of books and these movies that I think will pay dividends for generations to come long after we're gone, not just Joe Rowling, long after we're gone as well, which is a good thing you know, because that that no matter what she's saying now, those books are all about, you know, accepting the uh, people who have different opinions, different points of views, different experiences, different upbringings to be seen as equals. And that's a positive in the end. So, uh, all right. Well, there's our uh, review here of uh, the return to Hogwarts special on HBO max. We hope you enjoyed our show overall. Thank you very much. Uh, Shannon, what do we have to tell? Yeah. I'd like to follow us on social media on Twitter. It's at geek underscore buddies on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon, the geek buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK two. And if you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca says Mikey. Um, look, if you are a Gryffindor, a Hufflepuff, a Ravenclaw, or a Slytherin, we are glad that you are here and listening to us talk about all of this geeky stuff. Uh, and if you would like us to continue doing that, here is what you can do. You can smash that like button below. You can subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. You can leave some comments below and let us know what you thought about this stuff. Did you watch the Harry Potter special? What did you think of it? Let us know below. If you are listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anywhere podcasts are available, go ahead and leave us some stars and some comments because it helps us go up in the ranks. Rankings. And as always, the best thing that you can do is retweet this video, repost it to your socials, and tell all your friends to check out your good buddies, the Geek Buddies. There you go. And checking us out and making us possible, there is Carbon Health. Thank you so much for sponsoring our show and powering the Outlaw Nation. Want to remind you all to please keep this in mind. If you're looking for COVID testing, they have COVID testing at their local clinics uh, and they get, get you travel clearance testing as well. You can go to CarbonHealth.com to see where these 90 clinics are in 14 states and if there's any virtual care available in your area in 24 states for you to get access to good health. They believe everyone deserves it and they have urgent care, primary care, and virtual care for everybody uh, there uh, for you to have. So there you go. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us y'all take care of yourselves be well and we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode here from the geek buddies <laughs> <laughs>